Hey everyone, James here. Steph is out of town, so I bought a $2,500 satellite internet dish. That'll teach her. <laughs> Actually, Steph does know about this, but so I know what you're thinking to yourself. You're thinking, dude, didn't you just do a Starlink video like two weeks ago? And yes, I did. I installed the regular traditional residential dishy thing and ran cables, whatever. And then literally two days after I had finished up that install, Starlink announced the dish that I would have bought in the first place had it been available when I did that. And so now here it is. And the reason why I'm going with this instead of the thing I got to go and set up on a pole is because the setup, I, or a number of you commented on the last video that you know, you wouldn't bother with the setup because, oh, there's a tree. I'm not going to bother setting it up. And that scared me off of really wanting to pursue that a whole lot further because I know myself. And if my boss calls while I'm driving and says, you need to be on a conference call like in 10 minutes, I'm not going to take the time to set up a dish, right? So I'll probably put on clothes or something first. Anyway, so we've got the new Starlink High Performance Dish. And I've got, it's only available for RVs. So I'm going to show you like some things about how to install it that maybe you won't get in other videos because I'm all about like the, the hardware and the work of the install. As far as speed tests and comparisons with priority, not priority, residential or whatever, standard dish, high performance dish. I only have the one dish, so I'm not really super well equipped to do those kinds of comparisons. You'll find other videos for those. But if you're looking for like install details, like will this fit on my RV and how will I route the cable? This is the video for you. So let's get started. I'll show you kind of what's in the box. So let's start by going over some of the stuff that like the outside parts of the dish. So the first thing you get is the dish itself. Now, it was going to be difficult for me to fit this on the roof, so I had to measure it very exactly. I put those measurements on the board back there. It is exactly 510 millimeters wide. If you have a 511 millimeter gap, it will fit inside that. It is exactly 575 meters long. Again, one more millimeter, you'll slide right in. But, and this is kind of interesting, it is uh, not the same height on both ends. I don't know if you can see that there, but this end is a little bit taller than this end. On the short end, it is 34 and a half millimeters tall to the ground. And on the tall end, it's 42 millimeters. So there's like a seven millimeter, a quarter inch, a little more than a quarter inch difference between the front and the back or the back and the front. Now, they do give you this handy dandy template which is full size and it's great for locating the mounting holes. And the mounting holes, by the way, are 300 millimeters or 30 centimeters apart in the width direction and 400 apart in the length direction. But this template is not quite, it's like a couple millimeters shy of the whole dish. So don't necessarily use this if you're cutting it really close, but this will be great for locating the holes when we get to that point. Um, on the back, there are four mounting holes, and though there's this, I don't know if you can tell, but that's kind of like not a square kind of thing, like a trapezoid kind of shape there. Fortunately, the mounting holes do line up because I'm gonna mount this on a roof rack, and so I need things kind of parallel. So the mounting holes line up, that's great. They are actually it's just quarter inch, 20 threads per inch, kind of any standard quarter inch hardware, tripod mount, anything like that will pick that up. Although they do give you some special screws. Now, this mount that, this is the mount they give you. And yet, yeah, no, I'm not drilling holes in my roof. That's not gonna happen. I have a rack so that I don't have to drill holes in my roof. We're gonna come up with something else. But this may be useful. It does have these foam pads on it, which seem like they're gonna peel off and I'll just use it to cushion the dish on whatever mounting I wind up with. So, that's the dish, the measurements of the dish. So the way they have you mounted, if you look at the instructions for this mount, is they actually want it with this cable entry. See, there's the cable entry port. They want that facing forward, which seems backwards to me. And if you're not gonna use this wedge mount, that's actually on the high side. So I'm gonna put that side towards the back. It'll still have a tiny bit of a slope, not as much as that, obviously. A little bit of a slope so water can drain off, that kind of thing. But I'm not going to put that cable facing forward. That just seems wrong. Now, they do give you actually quite a bunch of hardware and a fairly complete 
hardware kit. They give you like thread locker. Um, they give you some silicone. A bunch of different mounting options, most of which I'm going to ignore because they would require, I mean, they give you like lag screws for like lagging into your roof or something. And yeah, I'm not, not doing that. But one thing they did include that I probably will use is this like crazy sophisticated nine piece cable entry gland thing with like a base plate and then a cover and a rubber stopper and some brass tubing to drill a hole in the rubber stopper. It's nuts, all this stuff they give you, but I might try it. Again, I'm not gonna go into my roof with it. I'm gonna go into the uh, cable mount port on our Winnebago Echo. It's Winnebago, they've got a place designated for you to have cables come in. So I may use it there, but I do kind of like the super sophisticated cable entry gland. Most of this hardware, no. Now, they do give you, one thing you wanna be careful if you're using some other hardware for mounting on the bottom, is you don't wanna get it too long and like drill up into whatever electronics are up inside of there. So they give you a little shorties, they're like, uh, it's like a half inch long. Don't get anything too much longer than that. You don't wanna risk drilling up or screwing up into the bottom of the dish. So that's kinda the outside stuff. Next, I guess I'll show you the, the inside bits. A lot of it's what you'd expect. So first, praise the Lord, they give you like an actual regular ethernet cable, which will come out of this uh, power adapter brick. That's what this thing is, some sort of power adapter brick. Um, and it's not a regular rectangle, so I couldn't give you like an actual size, but it's less than 12 inches long and less than six inches wide. So if you got a six by 12 space and it's, I didn't measure even the height because I'm not concerned about that one. Anyway. That goes this big cable, which is fairly thick, and they say you're not supposed to bend it with a radius of anything less than two inches, so that's about what you can bend safely. Um, that's the big cable that goes to the outdoor dish with this giant connector. The connector on the other end is smaller, so that's the end we're gonna be fishing through. It's, you know, that size-ish, that size. We'll be fishing that through. Um, of note is that this uh, battery brick or power cable, power brick, comes with its own mount, as does, and this is the same regular uh, router that comes with the other Starlink, except now they give you a, a stand to mount with it, so you don't have to like 3D print your own or anything like that. You can use the one that actually comes with it, and it mounts with just two screws into whatever you want to mount it into. So, power cable thing, I'd say that's, what is that, well here. It's less than two and a half inches tall. Okay, power cable. Now, as if other people have pointed out, there are two separate power cables gonna be required here, one for the router or a router because you have this regular ethernet cable, you can use your own router. So you'll need one for that and then one for this, which apparently can draw up to 200 watts or so. That's why we have a big power supply. Um, Beyond that, there's not a whole lot of surprises here. The big thing is gonna be what can I do with this cable and how it was gonna work for routing around on the roof, securing it and fishing it. I'm not too worried about securing it. Zip ties and whatnot will work fine. It's just getting that other end through my roof port that I'll have to think about a little bit. All right. Okay, and lastly, this is the stuff that I'm going to use to complete the install, the hardware store items, if you will. Uh, the most important is this aluminum channel. See, aluminum channel. Um, this stuff is one eighth of an inch thick. It has half inch legs and it is one inch wide. So I got pretty thick stuff because this is gonna span and I've already drilled holes in it too, by the way. I've just drilled some 5 16th holes because that's what fits on a roof rack or 5 16th carriage bolts. This is gonna span the crossbars of the roof rack and then the Starlink is just gonna mount onto here and I'll figure out where to put the mounting holes once I get it installed. Um, I got this stuff from Online Metals, and I just bring that up because they give you like a metallurgy report with everything you buy from them. It's kind of interesting. I'm not affiliated with Online Metals, but it seems like I am shopping there way too often. Anyway, that's where you can get the stuff if you need to. So metal channel, aluminum. Uh, some Romex. Um, now remember, there's two things that need to plug in, and I've I've identified a cabinet where I'm gonna put this and it'll be behind a wall so I won't have to see it all day. So, but there are two things you gotta plug in. You gotta plug in the power supply and you gotta plug in the router. And you might not want the power supply plugged in all the time, right? Because if it could be pulling 200 watts, I don't know what kind of battery capacity you have, but if you don't have 
enough to let that run 24 seven, you might want to put a switch. So I've got a switch, which I'll be installing so that I can just hit the switch. I don't have to open the cabinet and unplug it to turn off the power supply. But the router, I mean, I might want LAN, even if I don't have WAN. So I'm gonna install this outlet in kind of a half hot configuration. So half of it will be powered all the time. The other half will be running from the switch. We'll get to that eventually. Um, some other uh, hardware store, these are stainless steel, uh, hex cap bolts um, because of the mount that they give you. They give you two bolts that have like these shoulders on them. It's like a key hook kind of thing where you meant to slide it on. I'm not going to do that. So I needed regular bolts. Got those. And yeah, the rest of it is just, you know, little odds and ends and some Romex. So I guess we'll just get to it. That starts on the roof. Now I've already put the carriage bolts on the roof and I've already got this drilled. So we just need to get it mounted up the right distance apart, and then we can drill the holes to mount the Starlink. All right, so here we are on the roof, and I've brought this to help me get the spacing of these things right. So here we go. Just get them on there. So those are 5 16 stainless carriage bolts with uh, some washers and the little nylon lock nuts. Now we're going to mark the holes and I'm going to measure them to make sure that they are 30 centimeters and 40 centimeters apart. Okay, now remember I wanted to keep this foam strip, so I'm going to mount that here. So to do that, I'm just going to wipe this down denatured alcohol. Easy peasy, all right. Yeah, there are some instances where I'm okay forcing a bolt in if the, if the hole isn't quite straight on, but $2,500 dish, not one of them. So I decided it was better to take it off, mount it here, and then we can flip this and mount it back where it was. So here we go. All right, dish mounted. Okay, running this cable, this crazy big mount, or crazy big, uh, what do you call it, connector. Looks to be pretty easy, but it's getting pretty dark, so I don't know that I'll get it inside the RV tonight, but we'll see. But I'm going to run this back away from all the solar cables to the uh, roof port. New day. These short winter days are really cramping my style. Anyway, today we're going to get the cable from the Starlink flat high performance dish from the outside to the inside. And to do that, I'm going to use the Winnebago roof entry port. But you still have to seal up the cable hole on the outside of the port. And for that, I'm going to use this highly complicated cable sealing device that is included with the Starlink kit. Now, it consists of a number of parts. There are these gaskets. They go down and then there's this inner ring. And by the way, this goes together with these dovetailed keys. Don't test fit it. It's actually rather fragile, and when you try to pull it apart, you'll probably break it. I still have enough of a connection where I can use it, but don't try to make any test fits with this. That'll go in like that, and I cut a hole in this rubber stopper. The rubber stopper will go in there, and then this will go down on top of it, sort of like that, and that will snap together, but I'm certainly not going to try that until I'm ready to go. So, that's what we're going to do, and instead of putting it on the top of the roof outlet box, I am going to put it on the backside to kind of keep it out of the driving rain should we drive through in rain. Now the only weak link, the only thing I might modify on this is that this will just mount to the roof outlet port with these wood screws. And that roof outlet box, it's just plastic. I'm not sure how I feel about just anchoring that with these wood screws in the plastic. So just in case I got some uh, machine screws and lock nuts if I can get my finger into the tiny little three quarter inch hole I got to drill and hold a nut on there, I may try to use those instead of these. We're just going to see how that goes when we get up there, but that's the stuff. So let's get outside and get to it. 
All right, here we go. I've already sort of marked the location where this hole goes. It's a three quarter inch hole and I'm using this uh, Forstner bit. There we go. All right. Well, it is a thick roof, but I can see daylight, so we're doing pretty good. Now, I'm going to go outside. Steph is going to stay here while I try to push the cable in. <laughs> so, bye. Got it. All right, so pull slowly. The next step, according to these instructions, is to use a tube to drill a hole in the, uh, in the center of this rubber plug. Now, they give you two tubes, and they're different diameters, but, you know, the cable is eight millimeters, and so this one's... The smaller of the two. This one's more like a, a whole centimeter. So use the smaller tube when it's time to drill the hole. Um, and then they just show someone like a like a, a hand drill, and that just seems like <laughs> a disaster waiting to happen. So we're going to take this over to the drill press. I don't know if I want my fingers that close to this. <laughs> this is sort of an unusual drilling operation. So I have set my drill speed very slow. It's just 250 RPMs. And let's try to get that centered. Ta-da! Now the idea is you use a utility knife and cut a slit in this so that you can wrap it around the cable because the cable's already run through the hole so we can't put anything pass down the cable at this point. So here we go. Seems I should have cut maybe the larger hole because that is not closing up well. All right, take two. I've got the larger brass rod on here for drilling this hole because by the time I got the cable in there, it drills a slightly undersized hole. So here we go. Note to self, or to you, when drilling the uh, holes in that rubber stopper with a brass tube, use the larger tube. The smaller one doesn't fit around this all that well by the time you actually get the hole drilled. But now, speaking of drilling holes, we're to the point where I'm going to mount this thing on the back of this box. So I'm going to mark the hole locations using this rubber gasket, and then I'm going to pre-drill holes. Now, it's very tight in there and i can't imagine being able to actually hold a nut behind there while i tightened it on so we're going to really hope that these uh wood screws that they have provided are going to do the job so here we go marking holes pre-drilling the holes since i'm about to put a gasket in here i'm going to clean this off so that i'm not trapping dirt underneath the gasket which might eventually lead to a leak now is the point, point where you put these things together with these little dovetail. See that dovetailed key? It goes in there and that one goes in there. It's a one-time thing though. Don't count on redoing it. All right, these screws actually seem to be biting okay into this stuff. But you have to be very careful because it's like, it's not going to stop. You could just keep going and then just strip out the hole. So pay attention to how much tension you're putting on the screw and that one I need to back out a little bit and to finish this up slip this around the cable wedge it into the hole like so and we're gonna put this thing around the cable and this just has little clippies that kind of go in like that but again Consider it a one-time thing. It's flimsy plastic. There we go. All right. All right. Now looking good. There. And done. And I've cut out a lot of the swearing and tantrums and whatnot that happened in between the last clip and this. So, after fighting with the Starlink cable entry gland, I'm actually going to recommend that you don't use this. And there are a few reasons for that. First, it's just rude. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you paid $2,500 
for a satellite dish and they give you this thing, but there's a rubber stopper and they couldn't drill an appropriate hole in the rubber stopper. They're the ones with the factory. You're probably in an RV, in an RV park somewhere. I had a drill press and I thought that was difficult to get the hole the right size. To get it to all mush in there and be flush across the top like it's supposed to was difficult. Number two, the plastic parts are kind of flimsy. Like you can't test fit them because if you do, they break when you take them apart. And there was enough of them still together that I was able to get this to work. But had I tried to take it apart one more time, it would have failed. And number three, when you're all done, you're not going to be comfortable enough with it and you're gonna wind up gooping a bunch of silicone around here like I'm about to do anyway. And if you're doing that, then why are you fighting with this for like what felt like hours, right? And they acknowledge this because they give you their own brand of silicone to, okay, this is how you correct the shortcomings of our cable entry. Anyway, so putting some silicone on it now, and then we're gonna leave this alone and go inside and do the parts of the install there. But it's getting dark, so that'll probably be like tomorrow. A little dollop on each of these screw heads as well. So my idea was to just run this cable through here and then behind here there's sort of an empty utility space and I've run wires through there before. So my idea was to bring this little wall, it's just a board, forward to the front of this and then be able to use that whole cabinet. But I mean, it's kind of a lot of stuff you know that I got to try to fit in there so remains to be seen how well that will work I may have to put something in here and something in, I don't know we'll see starts with uh, taking this off so here we go hmm well it's not super crowded back there but let's just Let's start with like this bad boy. This is the uh, power supply. I could always maybe use a different router, but the power supply has is, is got to go. So let's see how big this is. Not quite tall enough. On the, could go on the bottom. Okay, time to stare at things and think. We're back and it's the next day because what happened is I stared at stuff for kind of a long time, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And then I did it and that got into the night. And so here we are, it's the next day. So I cleaned up the wiring in there, obviously, because I wanted to make room. We're gonna start calling this the server closet because that's kind of the stuff that's gonna be going in here. So needed to make some room for things. That's why the wiring's all cleaned up. I also added an outlet, a 120 volt outlet into this cabinet. That's Steph's cabinet. She didn't have one, this one did. She wanted one, so now she has one. Then I put this outlet in here to power the Starlink. And now the Starlink, there's this power brick. And apparently this power brick can consume like, you know, a couple hundred watts of power when it's running. And it's the kind of thing that people are worried they might not want to leave on all the time. And okay, I get it. We have plenty of battery power, but still, maybe I don't want to leave it on all the time. So I wired this outlet up with a switch, but I did it like what they call half hot. So basically the top half of the outlet has power all the time. And the bottom half of the outlet only is covered by this switch. So I could plug in a router or something else in here that could be on all the time and then leave the bottom only for turning on and off when we want to turn on the Starlink. Okay. Now, this is the cable that came in from the outside. I've drilled a three quarter inch hole here and I put a little grommet on here. We'll pass the cable through, plug everything up in here. I've pulled out from underneath the carport and then we'll, uh, we'll try to get this thing fired up and see if, we can, uh, see if we can get it working. And then I'll build some sort of a door. I think we need to use magnets to kind of keep a door on this. Anyway, that's what we're gonna do. this. The non-standard cable that you have to work with with Starlink is kind of an issue because it comes in one length and if you had a longer RV you're kind of SOL. 
And if you've got a smaller RV like us, you've got a bunch of cable you don't need that you have to find some way to coil up and keep in there. So that's what this mess is about. Uh, activating. There are instructions that I brought back here somewhere. <laughs> Since I bought this from Weingart, you don't activate it in the normal way. Wedge mount. Didn't use it. Uh, regulatory notices. Don't care. Supply and power supply and Wi-Fi mounts. Pieces of garbage. Packing slip. Okay. Here we go. Um, so now I'm going to try to activate this just uh, by following these instructions. I'm anticipating difficulty because I already had a Starlink and I set up an account and then I sent it back to get a refund when I got this new one. So I'm just expecting that it's going to be jacked. And of course, you can't call. I'm really getting my Twitter account suspended. You can't call customer service. You have to like send them an email through the app and wait a day for them to respond to you. So... <laughs> this video may go on in the next week. Okay, here we go. <laughs> we apologize for the delay. You can also visit www.wineguard.com slash support for support guides and videos for troubleshooting common issues. Told you. <laughs> it's wanting me to buy the dish again. I'm not doing that. And... We're back. So I finally did get the Starlink working. So tip, if you have a Starlink already and then you get the new high performance dish from WineGuard, from a reseller, the only way I, I could figure out to get that set up was by creating a new account with Starlink. So now I have two accounts of Starlink, one for my old canceled stuff and then one for the new high performance dish from WineGuard. If you had bought the high performance dish directly through Starlink, I would have been able to add it in the normal way, but it didn't seem to want to let me do that without having to charge me again for the dish, which I didn't really feel like paying. Anyway, so I did get it working. Now, let me show you how this uh, server closet wound up. So this door is just a, a piece of the plywood there, and it just goes up with magnets. So there's these little four brackets in the corner here, and this just clank goes up with magnets. Easy enough. We've got the router in here, and for right now, we're using the Starlink router, and then the power brick, and I've just stuck this to the floor. I didn't use either of the mounts for either of these dishes. And this is just stuck to the floor with, uh, with uh, command strips, a little picture hanging Velcro command strips. And that's it. Other than that, the cabinet is just as it was before. Now, speeds. We are sitting in the, uh, in the driveway here, and we've been getting speeds, you know, reasonable speeds, and I'll do a speed test now. Okay, we're getting like, you know, 30-ish or so. Um, but we took it for a drive the other day, and we were getting speeds anywhere between 80 to 90 megabits per second download to 2 megabits per second. It, it does work while in motion and rather well, but it varies wildly in terms of the speed. You turn left and then your speed drops. You turn right and then it goes back up. It was, it was interesting and I couldn't discern any pattern from how that worked. Maybe more testing is required there. There we go. We wound up with 43 down and 5.2 up, 58 milliseconds of latency. And that's just here in the driveway. So more testing needed on, especially on the in motion thing, because it was it varied, like I said, wildly. So anyway, that's the install, the physical install of the Starlink high performance flat dish for in motion use. Um, comments, questions, leave them down below. There'll be a link in the description on this YouTube video. It'll take you to a post on the Fit RV. Well, I'll, I'll put a few more details and you can ask questions. You can leave comments there. And that's going to do it. Um, a lot more testing and stuff to play with, but uh, that'll be in another video. We'll see you later. Bye.